Dann ist ihr Vorname, Nachname, alles zusammen. N und R. Hi guys, can you hear me? Oh uh, yes, I can hear you. Just waiting for a couple of minutes. I've already started recording, so don't say anything you wouldn't want to say. Or rather, don't say anything that you wouldn't want other people to hear and remember for the rest of you. <laughs> um, we'll wait for a couple of minutes. Um, today, because the meeting is at 10 o'clock, I think several people are not going to attend, but uh, I do not know. I got a message, I got messages from several people saying that they won't be able to attend. Um, I don't know whether it's because the meeting is at 10 o'clock or because whether, uh, you know, people are getting back from vacation or on vacation before the last days of summer, summer vacation. You can see the screen, right? Yes. Who's the person on the iPhone? I don't know who that is. Hi, that's Natalia. Hello, Natalia, how are you? Did you have a nice vacation? I did indeed. Um, today was my first uh, day back at work. Oh. I hope uh, attending the Capital Markets SIG meeting is good for uh, easing back into work. <laughs> indeed, yes. <laughs> Um, so since you were gone, uh, we have had a couple of, uh, I think one meeting, and uh, we've also had several people putting a lot of stuff onto the uh, website for the projects. Um, so I think I think I'm going to start right right away. Um, because it's better to do it this way uh, rather than wait for uh, people who are going to be late. They can always listen to the uh, recording to uh, get any of the pulse of wisdom that we scatter. So the first thing to say is that we have, we are governed by the antitrust policy notice and I hope you can see it uh, on your screen. And the only requirement for this is that we uh, adhere to the antitrust policy. The only requirement for participation in this meeting. 
the other thing is all are welcome in the hypology community and this is the uh, part of our um, hypology code of conduct which uh, which uh, says that we have to be uh, basically welcoming to everybody and be civil to people even when we are disagreeing with them if we are disagreeing with them uh, that's the only requirement uh, I mean that's the other requirement sorry um, now let's go over the uh, you know the people who are on the call let's introduce each other and I just saw that Stan has joined um, hi Stan um, so I think we should start with Stan since he's the one who just joined. Uh, hi, so we're talking about the intros, right? So, yes. uh, I'm, so I'm Stan Lieberman. Um, I work at uh, CME Group. So I'm focused on the DLT applications to the, uh, uh, specifically the derivative exchange space. Um, been doing Quite a bit of research been involved with Hyperledger uh, for a few years, so I'm here to kind of uh, uh, see the uh, the space events, and this is the perfect uh, uh, place to discuss the uh, the use cases and the uh, opportunities in the space. Thanks. My name is Vipin Bharatan. I had worked in um, capital market space for maybe 15 years, developing um, front to back applications. So I'm familiar with a lot of uh, the activity in the space and the limitations and problems with, uh, with uh, the application of block blockchain technology to the space as well as technical aspects of what it takes to put things in production in a um, heavily regulated enterprise. Uh, and I hope to bring some of that to the uh, to the CMC. The, uh, my other interests are uh, in the digital identity space and I'm also the chair of the identity working group and I've been uh, uh, working on various things in Hyperledger for a while. Uh, I met Stan for the first time back in uh, 2015, 2016, I think, um, mm -hmm. when we did the first um, Hyperledger hackathon. Um, so let's go down the list. Uh, the next one is uh, Natalia who's also the vice chair of this group. Natalia, can you uh, share your uh, intro if you yes. want to? I was, I was on mute, apologies. So my name is uh, Natalia and I work on uh, capital markets origination, um, specifically in bond origination, all types of bonds, um, commercial paper, and project, and project finance. Um, the interest of joining this group is basically because despite I work on the business origination side uh, with issuers, uh, I also need to understand all the technology um, changes and, and disruption on the settlement processes, and, and that's why I'm interested in, in joining and participating and collaborating in this space, despite I don't have a technical background. We definitely need people like you because technical uh, only does not cut it because we may be building the wrong thing. The next one on the list is Kelly. 
And my name is Kelly Cooper, and I work also in a compliant regulatory space, but education or higher education. And I'm frankly a little bored after a lot of years of that. And this is a nice fit and interesting, both capital markets and identity. Saptarshin. Uh, hi, this is Satoshi here. Uh, I work for Paramount Software Solutions and uh, we're part of the Hyperledger community for the last uh, one year. And uh, I'm really excited. Uh, this is my first call with the uh, Capital Market Special Interest Group and looking forward to learn and if anyway I may be able to contribute something. Thank you. Satoshi, don't forget to um add yourself to the um, to the list of participants on the meeting agenda in the meeting. I've, I've already got that going, Vipin. I just have Oh, beautiful. Saved. Thank I you, Kelly. Haven't, I just haven't updated it, but I'm on it. Thanks. Okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, but I just wanted to, uh, you know, also the details of the, where, you, where Saptashi works and also uh, possible contact. Anyway, so according to our agenda, which I had created, we are going to one. You know, one thing that we're going to do is we're going to uh, talk to Natalia about the wife share uh, business. So let us discuss uh so the main thing about the vice chair is that uh, you know according to the charter anyway it's um for the vice chair to be running the calls if the chair is not available uh for that you know you need to know how to claim the host role and to record and so on and so forth. Uh, and also, of course, set up the agenda and the meeting. So you want to talk about what it means to you. And also, you know, maybe we should have you run some, some of the meetings because that is a good way to set it up so that we can uh, all benefit from your knowledge. Sure. So, so from my side, it's the first time that I am using the the space. Um, so, so I would need indeed to learn how to how to use it. Um, I'm more than happy to set up the next meeting in two weeks' time. So I could reach out to you, maybe, uh, Bipin, if if I have any 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 doubts on how to do that. I've been already. You know, looking through through the page and 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 trying to see the different applications, but would definitely need probably some some help, but but I would try with with no issues. You know, Kelly is uh, an expert also in this um, running the meetings, uh, doing um, scribing or, or, or the meeting minutes and so on. Um, so she would be a wonderful uh, person for you to talk to in case you have doubts and, and if I'm not reachable. Um, and the next item on the agenda was call for volunteers to scribe, but Kelly has already taken the ball by the, the bull by the horns. And uh, she's already doing, you know, scribing. Um, the next one is this uh, tech blog. Okay, so we are meant to launch and announce this uh, capital market SIG during Cybos in London on happening between the 23rd and the 26th. Uh, mostly it'll be Karen, you know, doing that. But I can tell you that I'm planning to go, but I haven't yet uh, gotten an uh, got a, uh, invitation or a ticket. 
uh, I need to apply for one. Um, so if anybody knows, how, you know, apparently you can do it even if you're not um, not a member of CYBOS, uh, but you have to give them a good enough reason. And as part of launching this um, this uh, capital markets, we will uh, share a short technical or or a launch blog uh, i have already started working on it taking the charter which we have and i want to share the technical blog for with you guys for a second and i want to get some reactions um you know So the blog is I have the draft here, which is mostly uh, you know the stuff that I took from the charter, but I want to expand on the projects because that's where I think we are going to make uh, a um, an impact so please get back to me you know like let's discuss what exactly needs to be in the blog either directly in person or as comments or whatever you know you you can you're welcome to put what whatever you want in there in order for us to represent the cm sig i get the feeling that uh it might be too elaborate what I'm putting here, but for purposes of presentation in uh, Cybos, we will uh, have just a short um, bunch of screens. But the main idea would be to promote it so that more people uh, join us from that world and cybos as you know is um, a conference sponsored by swift so there will be lots of uh, participants usually so um i want your reaction to this uh, this idea and also september september's theme for uh hyperledger is apparently fintech so any ideas on this would be welcome. I guess uh, nobody's got immediate reaction to this. I guess my question is, so the target audience is to bring people in because it looks like a document. Should it look a little more like a magazine or with some imagery or should it look like a document? Because I've not been there before. I think uh, that's what I was saying. I just started it as a document, but I think it would be more uh, effective um, with two formats one is of course a slightly more elaborate thing like a document but for a presentation it has to be some kind of a uh, you know set of slides which which has imagery like you said and so we don't we don't know if someone is going to present it or if someone non-affiliated would present it and the reason i ask is let's just say for example the slides would be different if you were there talking while people show the slides versus if someone else is showing the slides or putting the slides up on a break so that the slides themselves need to be the sum of both what they show and what you would say. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for all purposes, we should assume that I'm not going to be there, but um, 
but I'm uh, definitely trying to be there uh, and you know we'll we'll try to be there so there may be multiple presentations not just the slides but you know they wanted to do an interview if some if any of you are going to be there like Natalia I don't know whether you're going to be at Cybos but uh, if any of your colleagues are going to be there it would be worthwhile to uh, present and I am sure that people from other parts of Hyperledger are going to be there and there would be also people from the SIGs uh, like the supply chain trade, trade finance and other SIGs which are focused on financial uh, markets may be there so uh, you you're right that it has to be fit for purpose in the sense that can it exist alone or does it need some kind of commentary? The next item uh, I think is going to be the obstacles uh, paper that was started by Kelly and uh, she'll probably want to discuss that for a bit. Should I bring that? Yes, please, if you would put it on screen. Thank you, Bipin. And if you'll, there you go, yeah. Okay, so what I did so far was to, if you'll scroll down a little bit, what I did so far was to go over a little bit more, please, down into the body of the text. What yeah. I did was to go over, um, okay, just to make a long story short, um, I teach some graduate classes for the University of Maryland and I have access to their library, which is, exceptional in its digital archives because they have so many students and as i mentioned earlier capital markets is not my field i'm on the periphery but not in the middle of it as natalie is and so what i am doing is i'm going through research articles and pulling out what it looks like on in the sector that people have concern, both concerns about and that where they think that blockchain might be a solution. And so rather than really starting a long narrative of that, what I'm doing is I'm putting in bullets to hopefully get feedback from people in the space as to whether it's important or relevant, et cetera. And so under, for example, trust, I note sharing of sensitive information such as board portals and the research that I'm looking at is talking about effective proxy voting and one of the other things discussed is the need for trust and privacy pre-IPO. Um, also improving information transparency and shareholder participation. And then I have the categories of trust and provenance if you'll continue to scroll Vipin. Yes. In provenance, I have chain of custody and reduce the time from trade to settlement for securities and other asset classes. And then immutability. So on some you'll see I have a few bullets and on some I have none um, because I'm still working on them. And then down at the bottom, I added this week auditing because I found a couple of articles um, where they were talking about the potential in the space with auditing. And what my thought is that there are these categories that I've noted with the larger header, and then I'm putting bullets in based on the research that I see. And then once we get to where we're satisfied with the categories and we're satisfied with the bullets, they could always be edited. But the main idea is this would add value and this would help people who are working in business in the space understand the possibilities and obstacles of blockchain, then at that point, we can start then changing this into more of a narrative where we're addressing each of the bullets in a combination of re references to uh, work cited, which I started down below, and also kind of definitions and 
how that works with Hyperledger. Someone also suggested, and it's a good idea, that we talk about Ethereum vulnerabilities. And then I also added additional blockchain ecosystem vulnerabilities because some of the stuff that I'm looking at is Corda, for example. And so for this obstacles paper, what I'm hoping is that people will either add bullets or maybe at the end of a bullet, put a plus one in there or make a comment so that we'll know that that's on track. And then each week I'm just going through and beginning then to build the narrative based on what we think about or if we think that these categories add value and these bullets add value. And then if they don't, then I think it would be good to either take it out or maybe better a minus one rather than take it out because we do lose things sometimes and someone might have a different perspective on it. So I need some help on kind of prioritizing and for lack of a better word, valueizing the topics that I'm putting in based on research. I was the one who put in the uh, Ethereum vulnerabilities uh, paper link. Good idea, yeah. Uh, the reason I did that is not because, not because of the fact that we are, um, um, let's say we are harboring Ethereum directly inside Hyperledger, but the categories under which those uh, vulnerabilities abilities are presented uh, are still relevant for all of the DLTs under Hyperledger. Meaning, yes, I... let's say that you talk about re-entrancy attacks. Re-entrancy attacks would be a problem in a uh, smart contract language that was very uh, wide in the sense that it is Turing complete that i mean i know that stan or others in the technical space will have something to say about that uh, there are some other uh, vulnerabilities uh, that are you know it's it's a very extensive survey of uh, vulnerabilities and i'm sure that many of those vulnerabilities can also affect um, the dlts that we have uh, whether people have really thought about them or not that's another story and how it's relevant to capital markets, maybe that's another uh, another angle that we should pursue. But uh, this was my thought, and if anybody has any comments on this, especially people like Stan, I would uh, assume you, as a practitioner, would have knowledge of some of these, uh, and, and the mitigations, you know. <laughs> It's not just the vulnerabilities, it's also what we should do to prevent uh, this uh, from from damaging. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think this, uh, this discussion is uh, kind of, uh, I mean, I guess for me, everything ends up boiling down to use cases, right? So they, um, all, a lot of these vulnerabilities are truly applicable only for the public chain. But then if we talk about um, private deployments of Ethereum, then we also run into the question of, are we leveraging the EVM? So are th which vulnerabilities are specific to that? Which ones are specific to the, uh, you know, the consensus protocol or the more of a I guess, communication layer? So it's going to boil down to the specifics where they're applicable. So I think it's really helpful to have a uh, kind of a thorough survey of uh, these vulnerabilities so we can see where they apply to the particular implementations, well, proposed implementations or I guess ideas of where the technology can be used in uh, uh, capital market systems. So this is the uh, paper that I got, mm -hmm. uh, which has all of the, it's a very comprehensive survey. Uh, but anyway, we, we might be getting lost in the weeds a little bit here. I, I'm also very interested in uh, your comments about 
uh, Kelly's paper as a whole, uh, one of the things that I feel that uh, we could have a problem with is that it is a very vast, right? I mean, we have in her in in the paper that uh, she, uh, you know, Kelly's paper has a lot of headings like, you know, mm -hmm. are we chewing off uh, more than we we um, we can handle at this point or should we stay sort of uh, broad like this and then go into uh, something like two or three specific things that are applicable to capital markets the way we started off kelly talking about the most important or the things that bother people the most well when we were first talking about the paper um the group was saying that they're struggling to communicate to business stakeholders. And so I was thinking, what is it that they're trying to communicate to business stakeholders and what are those obstacles? So it, the target audience wasn't so much people who are deep in, it was more an introductory paper that is an overview so that people will just get their mind off of Bitcoin, if nothing else. And that was what we discussed in the first meeting. Now, it could be that that's switching and it could be that we want to kind of reorganize the paper or rethink the target audience, any of which I am happy to do. But my thought in setting this up was me sitting down with someone who for the 100th time is asking me what these things are, but there's a thousand generalist articles out there and I didn't want it to sound like that either. I wanted it to start to connect. So if I was sitting down with someone, I would want it to connect that, hey, relook this, rethink this, let's go a little bit deeper. And then that was kind of the sum role of this paper from a, a more thoughtful educational perspective or learning perspective. But if we think, instead that the target audience for the paper would be people who are working in the industry who have a, a, a modicum of understanding of what blockchain is and now we really want to go deeper into the obstacles i'm i'm fine to do that as well if we think that both are needed then perhaps this first one could be an introduction um, to obstacles which would be a narrative of getting a comfort level to then go a little bit deeper and then a second paper could select some of these to go deeper on because I, I totally am in agreement with what everyone is saying on the call where I my thinking is is going back to our first meeting when someone said hey what we really need is to be able to have something that people can read so that they at least you know we can get out of just a thousand introductory conversations based on what someone saw on the television yeah in fact the whole ethereum vulnerability section is about that because whenever you talk about anything they start talking about uh, you know the dao hack or when something is stolen or something so we have to have uh, you know context setting so the other other thing that i want to uh, i mean the i also want to get the um, feedback from people in the business like natalia natalia and uh, also Soptarshi to, and of course stan and i agree with stan that all of these things have to be linked together in the end i mean there's we are creating these separate projects, but there are linkages in the back. Like for example, the obstacles will link with the, with the use cases and so on. Anyway, so go ahead, Natalia, if you have. Just so for, for, from my perspective, um, what, what I'm gonna do, if, if I may, is just to, to, to read exactly the, 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 the content and, and make sure um, someone like me that, that does not necessarily understand 
um, the, the obstacles, for instance, uh, by reading the, the page, I find all the relevant information so that someone that may not have all the information can also understand. So it's clear and the structure is clear and the information is clear and the text is clear as well. And even if, if, if there is a need of any additional um, material or, or, or like not pictures, but other type of, of, of graphics, for instance, just so to, to let you know as well. That's very useful uh, to have a um, reader that is going to give uh, comments based on a perspective that that's a business oriented perspective. Yeah, also want to kind of comment on um, so kind of Kelly's uh, points, but I guess the direction for the paper. From my perspective, I've ran many, many times in the conversations with the business folks where they're so deep in the uh, this incumbent space where any idea of a change is uh, very foreign uh, to them. And they keep bringing up these uh, obstacles, actually, to adopting um, new technologies. And so having a paper which um, it's created by people who understand both the business and the technology would be tremendously helpful in kind of uh, teaching them about educating them on what are the ways to overcome these obstacles and that kind of demonstrate that people in the industry have thought about how to deal with the problems of adopting this new technology and what new opportunities it can truly bring. Stan, um, the mm -hmm. challenges that we face um, in a incumbent space where the operations and the already existing uh, uh, people feel threatened by this new technology, and this kind of uh, obstacle is more of a behavioral uh, obstacle, even though they might say things about the technology itself based on their uh, generalized reading, like Kelly said. Mm -hmm. um, but this behavioral ob obstacle, you know, I have been thinking about it quite a bit because I've been reading some behavioral economics and behavioral finance. Uh, and I feel like some of those techniques could be useful in converting the skeptics uh, to uh, adopters, not by pushing the, uh, not by pushing certain things, but by the way the technology is architected and uh, the choices are presented and uh, the uh, you know, the techniques that have already been used and in, in I, I don't know whether any of you have read uh, the Nudge uh, book, book by uh, Richard Taylor, who is a Nobel Prize winner in economics recently. And this, there is a whole movement of, on behavioral economics which might address some of the uh, issues that Stan just brought up, because I think I think we are not going to get over on technical merits alone. It's going to be have to be a combination of various things. Uh, logic alone does not uh, trump everything else. And sorry for the use of the word trump, but hey. Um, so as we saw in various uh, contexts, including the political one. But, uh, I completely agree, but I also think that having a well articulated, uh, kind of a well thought through set of uh, points will be very helpful in uh, at least uh, 
dissuading some of the fears. One of the um, one of the challenges is going to be uh, a, a Richard Thaler's method. Um, you know, obviously relies on the fact that people are people. You know, they are lazy, they are resistant to change. They are, you know, there's a whole bunch of attributes that people possess that, you know, obviously are used uh, in the design of the alternatives that you present. Um, but in addition to that, there is a measurement um, aspect, meaning you would say, okay, let's, let's try to see whether this particular method is effective and that is by measuring the, you know, that particular method rather than just theorizing about it. So that is a that is a challenge in this space. I don't know how to go about it. I'm actually slightly lost about how to measure uh, different uh, pathways, you know for adoption in capital markets of DLTs, it has to be through uh, already, uh, you know, the pilots and uh, use cases and production systems that are out there and the real problems that they have run into. I completely agree. Uh, one of the first questions that uh, here business people ask when we start talking about a proof of concept is, and we talk with a uh, technology vendor, is has it been implemented in production? Has it been launched? What was actually done? And I think just looking at the publicly available information and in the news, there are quite a few of those pilots that are gradually getting to production so far, for like a smaller scale, or in case of the, uh, I think it was IBM's, um, wasn't supply chain, but in this internal, like, uh, yeah, the finance system. Thing. Yep, uh, not the trade finance, but they actually the first yeah, product they the launched was management the, of uh, in, uh, internal investments. Or yep, it, 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 I thought it was like inventory management or something like that, or tickets, but. Anyway, it was actual production, even if it was internal. So if we also build up a uh, library of these implementations, again, to point at specific use cases would be another great benefit. Okay, so can we then uh, say that each one of these uh, items like trust, provenance, uh, uh, you know, immutability, identity, data integration, interoperability, ML, KYC, GDPR, and so on and so forth, will be uh, linked, if possible, to a solution of the perceived obstacle, uh, which is obviously uh, the project that you're spearheading, Ms. Tan. Uh, I think we have to keep it sort of lightweight with uh, with the links to publicly available information. Uh, but I'm I'm having great difficulty getting into any kind of a public detail, public information other than press releases of uh, some of these solutions. I can think of. Uh, only a couple, like ASX uh, project, has extensive public review of technical matters. In fact, uh, yesterday or day before, it was announced that DAML, uh, I mean DA and VMware are uh, collaborating on taking that ASX uh, chest replacement project forward. <coughs> what about your? project, Stan, uh, I mean, is, is public information available about this? Uh, no, unfortunately not. And uh, looking, judging from the comments, it won't be. <laughs> uh, it may change uh, shape and become more public in the future, but um, 
even though it was fairly successful in reaching its goals. Um, Are you talking about started, RMG or something else? Uh, something else. So RMG has been a, uh, in a way it was a failed. So RMG is public. So, um, and all the information has been available that uh, we're not gonna be providing the exchange for that. And what is, I'm not gonna talk about the non-publicly available information, but it was basically stopped due to lack of customers. And a lot of that is, my guess, is the fear of uh, the adoption of this new approach and uh, something like this document could at least, I may mean, not necessarily convince the uh, major businesses to adopt the new technology, but at least uh, consider the new markets that are built on this uh, uh, tech. So, and uh, I apologize, I need to drop out of a conflict. So this was a great call. We, are you going to have this conflict every day or every Wednesday or? Uh, no, today is just particularly bad. Okay. Um, and I know that you have been on vacation too, so hopefully uh, you'll come back, uh, you're back rejuvenated. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Superman. Thanks, everyone. Great call. So, Talk to uh, continuing that theme of uh, Stan's use cases, I can think of several where uh, there is public information available. One of them is the um, is uh, ASX project, which I just spoke about just now. The other one is of uh, the some projects in Northern Trust that has to do, do with uh, custody and with uh, Kelly, the point that you are bringing up corporate actions. Um, I know that DTCC also had some projects in that. So what I'm going to do is to reach out to some of these people to find out if there is more uh, publicly available uh, data and then we can slot them into these various uh, obstacle, uh, you know, obstacle uh, sections to say how this particular use case has taken care of this this particular obstacle. You know, uh, that might be useful. The uh, the other approach is uh, to contact contact people like um, Sandra Rowe, who was the head of um, the RMG project that we were mentioning, that is Royal Mint Gold, basically tokenization of uh, gold held in the Royal Mint by the CME group. And Stan has just said that it was not a very, uh, you know, it was a failure basically because of lack of customers, either due to the lack of marketing or what, whatever the reason is. But Sandra is now the head of um, Global Blockchain Council, and I'm sure that she will have insight into a lot of uh, positive uh, developments and use cases so maybe one of us uh, should contact her. I'll try to reach out to her about this. Any other ideas, guys? Uh, I've been working with Evernim. Um, I'm one of their early adopter customers or whatever the term is. And then also I'm looking at another organization that's doing um, smart contracts kind of as a legal legal for legal documents but could also relate into the um proxy situation so i'll i'll talk with both of those two and see if i can come up with some sort of a, a use case as well so is that the accord project with Klaus? Klaus? Mm -mm, no okay because they are 
they are doing that too. And okay. um, so that yeah, we 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 uh, will try to push forward on several of these use case uh, type situations and then link them back into either this uh, or to Stan's use cases. But in in other words, present a comprehensive picture which includes these obstacles, but also link them to the actual use cases. Um, if I go back to the projects, right, we have, um, Mani did put in some work on the um, standards, and he said he won't be around to talk about it today, but you know, he put in a section on is the CDM, but very limited kind of information there. But the key to note there is that there's a business process standards, and those business process standards relate to the legal agreements. I mean, each each um, contract, right? A swap or a derivative contract is a legal agreement, really. And uh, enforcement of those legal agreements through the use of smart contracts is uh, Part of is thus standard, uh, you know, common. Uh, I think it's called common domain model CDM. Um, and maybe we can get some information about that too. Uh, Saptarshi, do you have anything? Uh, I have just one question. I mean, today is my first day. But uh, my question will be, how do we quantify or measure, determine which are going to be the matrices for the ROI uh, related to any specific use cases if we pitch it to any client? Because execution, production, pilot, all these will come once in a discovery phase, we are determining precisely the right parameters to measure the ROI and convince our clients or customers. Then we go ahead and look into the future stages. Yeah, I mean, I have been involved in some of these efforts um, when we did a review of investments. Like, for example, we were trying to do investment in, let's say, a fintech. Uh, as part of that, we went through the complete review of the system. Uh, of the company, their uh, their uh, finances, and the team itself. And in addition, we were trying to project the ROI of a particular solution. And as a part of a business case that you present for any new project, that ROI part is very important. So if you have any experience with that, uh, it will be very useful to get your input. Please. It's, also, it's also difficult because everything is transaction based. You know, so, I mean, I've talked to some people that are 10,000 a month in the cloud and some that are 100,000 a month in the cloud. So I think it's, I think it's an excellent question. And are there, um, could we almost using a matrix set up you know, some sort of an incremental, even questions to ask. So it, it's one thing to quantify, which I think is critical, but it's difficult to even know what the questions to ask are because the blockchain is expensive. And once it scales, it's really expensive. And so I think both the, how do we quantify, but what are even the questions that go into leading us to be able to quantify? 
when you say blockchain is expensive and at scale it's even more expensive uh, what i mean do you have basis for this claim well i've been just in the introductory work that i'm doing with roi it's difficult all right i've talked to some people and just you know at various conferences and things like this so this is just my words rehashed and poc is not the problem prototype is not the problem but finding both the people and the capacity to scale and seeing whether you're with aws or ibm or self-hosting that it grows so quickly it's how is it that you determine ROA. I mean, you can say things like you're going to see such and such a reduction in fraud or the immutability provides this or that, but it. I'm finding, and, and it might be that it's just me, but I'm finding that it's not easy to determine ROI, to even ask the right questions, because we're talking about people who, if, if we think about the obstacles paper, we're talking about people who are brand new to a space and you're trying to quantify ROI while this thing is mid-air, you know. So I think that, anyway, I'm talking too much, but I think it, how to quantify it and even when you have the information and how to get the information to be able to quantify it are both obstacles, are both, you know, because there's, if you look at angel.co, you've got a thousand small companies trying to get in this space. And if you go anywhere else, you've got, all of the big players in it as well. And, and so I think that it's a, it's an important question. Yeah. I mean, the point is that, uh, the, uh, the big companies like IBM and, um, uh, people who have been selling this, uh, are probably answering these questions or asking these questions and using the answers to determine the ROI. Uh, the problem is how do we get, at this information, which seems to be very uh, business, uh, like a business secret, you know? Yeah, it's their secret sauce. Yeah, the, because companies are going to them because it seems insurmountable without it. You need the whole ecosystem. Yeah, um, so in that sense, there is a whole bunch of moves today, like uh, the cloud companies, that are making this frictionless, right? With uh, BAAS, blockchain as a service, or um, or uh, serverless. I, I get the feeling that they're going to go to serverless. It means going from administering these things in a very uh, in a very detailed manner, which requires a lot of manpower, to doing this at the click of a button. Uh, so maybe looking at what Amazon, Google, uh, and Microsoft are doing in this, uh, would help, uh, especially if they are, I mean, they're obviously making money from the scale, but will they make it cheaper to operate hundreds of, hundreds of nodes? You know? So Saptarshi, sub, if you are sitting with a customer and pretty much have them ready to go, but they really need more, they need to know what this is going to look like, what it's going to cost and what the return on their investment is. Can you tell us a little bit about how that conversation goes? So first of all, I would, I mean, from a business perspective, what I do is try to identify what are the revenue drivers for this vertical as well as for that specific customer within that vertical. Once I get that information, I also try to get the granular details, which could be the glue connecting the different complicated aspects and might be pretty much important to consider. So we have to classify them maybe in different segments or different layers. That is the first thing we do in a business document or business you know, consideration. And then we try to see, do they exactly have any technical thing implemented in their ecosystem? Are they really doing something which has got presence of IT? Or is it like we are the first guys to start from this scratch? So some cases, 
like in an arts industry, we are doing some works with the arts industry, one customer, they do not have at all any IT. So we are going to start it from this scratch for the other kind of customers who already have some IT, then we have to see what specific job that inclusion of technology is going to benefit them. How is it helping them? Then we come to the question of trials, provenance, and all the specific stuffs being mentioned here. Are they serving these purposes or is it going to be a major issue? If so, how much impact is it causing to their business, to their revenue, direct or indirect uh, revenue, as much we can dig deep deeds. And then we try to you know, relate with the specifics of blockchain from a very high level. Uh, we have few of our guys who help with these kind of works. So that is from a very basic level I can share right now. Uh, I mean, it depends again from customer to customer and vertical to vertical, but from my you know, knowledge, what I can say from a very high level is identify or segregate the different verticals, segregate the customer within that vertical, identify their revenue streams, identify what are the glues connecting those revenue streams, and then, you know, again, go further down into the primary, secondary, tertiary levels uh, of their, you know, uh, re revenue streams, which are going to benefit them and which are the challenges and how technology impact. So we really don't go into the blockchain aspect. Initially, we go into the business aspect and uh, it takes approximately, as I have seen in the past few cases, <laughs> one and a half months of time just to complete the discovery phase. Are you running, are you running into a lot of uh, data issues as far as um, data that won't talk to each other? Data integration issues with legacy yes, systems? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. I would say that, uh, again, in some cases, data integration is going to be an issue because they might be using some legacy infrastructure, some specific databases, so we have to consider, again, uh, the architect is better positioned to respond to those specific questions, but uh, what I understand is there are some challenges with integrating the, you know, specific environment in which they have stored their data in silos. Uh, so this becomes sometimes a challenge. I mean, I positioned, uh, blockchain as a service to one client, I mean, sorry, to one, uh, you know, lead, I would say not a client, uh, financial services uh, lead from New York City, I guess, yeah, New York City, I guess, a very big uh, financial service provider, but they hold all their data in uh, their servers. I mean, they do not push their data over to the cloud. So how do you implement blockchain when your client is not willing to push or pass over their data to the cloud environment at all because of privacy and other concerns. So that becomes another challenge to design the data architecture. So there are many other challenges as well. Uh, maybe we can discuss in the next calls, we can keep it as an agenda. And I would like to bring our architect as well who might give a better uh, view, his viewpoint on what he thinks and you know if anything could be added. That's really great. Yeah, we, we should have, anyway, we are running over time. And um, so can we connect over email and wiki and all that subtarshi so that we can keep this conversation going? Sure, so I work primarily with the public sector uh, special interest group and uh, today was my first year. And I'm connected with you over LinkedIn. So maybe I can send you a, you know, I can ping you over LinkedIn or I can send you an email and uh, we can continue yeah. the discussion. We would be uh, truly interested in uh, the ROI question, but specifically for the capital markets uh, uh, or financial services uh, industry. I mean, even if we get just the questions like, Kelly said, questions to ask rather than, you know, rather than the, the details of actually your engagement with this particular company, but more on a general level, if, if you have difficulty sharing that information, because, you know, you obviously have some NDAs and other things with them, right? Sure. So maybe uh, I may share some, you know, some document, some kind of a write up to you. You can look into that. Maybe if that could, uh, you know, add some thoughts to that. I have a very, you know, uh, high level, I, I would say, or very, you know, basic thoughts.
what I think could be adding values to the ROI question because whenever a technology vendor goes to a customer, uh, the first thing they're going to ask before doing anything else is ROI. What I'm going to get from this. Now the projection from a sales guy shows 80%, 70%, but when it's implemented in reality, the ROI is way too low than what has been claimed. So we want to create a credible ecosystem, a credibility in what we project and what comes in reality, not a diversion from the facts. And that's how we are going to win in the long run. Sounds good. Uh, so I think we should uh, conclude the meeting now, but I hope the next meeting will have more participants because summer vacation will be over and people will be back uh, in full swing. Thank you, everybody. Nice Thank you. meeting. Nice to meet Thanks you everyone. all. Thank all right. you. Thank you.